The Mao that will be forty dollars plus tip. Cha ching, cha chong, cha changaroo. Oh, From hey. pennies to dollars. No updates for you. Snow contest. Well, this is an easy decision. Ah, the memories. Wow, Sonic Three and Knuckles is such a great game, and its music. <laughs> oh God, what the hell? That is awful. Anyways, yay money. Make sure to buy the fun pack DLC kids. Cha ching, cha chingery. Get those Sonic Adventure remakes ready ASAP. Please don't do that again. Welp, Sonic Origins released the other day, and it's pretty disappointing. I was pretty excited for the collection overall originally, but as we drew nearer and more details started to come out, well, I had my expectations pretty low, and it felt like the writing was on the wall that this was going to be a development hell. Now, I'm a simple man. Bugs and such don't really bother me. I enjoyed the heck out of Colors Ultimate, only hearing the audio in one ear half the time, but there's pretty much no excuse for not only the lack of additions, quality of life features, customizability, overall sloppiness, and just lack of care Origins has for these four games. That being said, this is pretty much pertaining to everything outside of Headcanon's work on Sonic 3K, which we'll get into in a bit. Now, I've seen some confusion about who exactly worked on what, and from the information we have as of today, the quote-unquote Mania devs, aka Headcanon, was commissioned to work only on the Sonic 3 and Knuckles remake. The rest was done in-house by Sega, and it certainly shows. While all four of the games are on Christian Whitehead's proprietary retro engine, he had no direct involvement in Sonic Origins. But Stealth of Headcanon, who worked directly alongside Whitehead when making the retro engine versions of Sonic 1 and 2 that were on mobile back in 2012 and 2013, and also indirectly worked with him on the CD remaster prior to it being greenlit by Sega, all three of these games are featured in Origins, and if you play the decomps or mobile versions, you play the Origins versions just at a much cheaper cost. That being said, Stealth, who had just as much involvement in Mania, is the one leading the charge on 3K's remake that him and Whitehead have been pestering Sega about since, I don't know... You know, it's actually pretty funny how you can tell exactly what was worked on by Headcanon and what was worked on by Sega's in-house group. Well, since that's out of the way and the dislike bomb dropped by now, I like to go over the good of the collection before I get into the negatives. And, of course, I'm not telling you guys how to spend your money. If you're really enjoying it, that's totally okay. I just wanted to discuss why I'm pretty dissatisfied with my purchase, and it seems I'm not the only one. Alright, so one of Origin's biggest positives, especially if you're on something other than PC, like say, I don't know, Xbox or Switch, is having all four games in one place or a cartridge that you can pop in for full widescreen and the likes. I definitely see the reason in purchasing this collection for full price in that case. Or, especially, say you never played any of the Genesis games except like Mania, this is 100% for you. I can personally relate to that, as that's how I was with Sonic Colors Ultimate. I never played the OG Colors, and I picked up SCU, didn't really have any bugs, and loved the game. I was mainly buying Origins because having all the games in one place is pretty nice, and also having the achievements all on Steam is pretty cool too. I kept my expectations pretty realistic with this, as I wasn't expecting them to be adding every single Sonic game under the sun, with Sonic Schoolhouse as 100% unlockable. I understand that since the movies and Mania, there's been a whole new wealth of people who are interested in Sonic, haven't played or had access to the Genesis games, and wanted to play what is pretty much considered the, some of the best 2D platforms in the genre. So it only makes sense Sega wanted to capitalize on that and offer the absolute definitive versions of these games. Which they obviously thought since they delisted all the other versions of them. So since you have all these new people, wouldn't you want to pull all stops out and make this as awesome as possible so they can really experience why the Genesis games are so beloved? That's the thing. Under no circumstances are these the definitive versions of the game at all. Instead, we're sadly here talking about a pretty mixed bag, especially when compared to the past Sonic collections. It's a shame, especially for me, as personally, I only played the Genesis games for the first time when I made those videos at the beginning of my channel, so if around 20 year old me fell in love with these games, playing the shitty Mega Drive Ages Steam ports, which suck, Imagine what all these new players would have been like. What I'm getting at is this just feels so bare bones and forgettable as a collection, and it's really a shame as I know there were some people who actually put a lot of effort into it. If you aren't familiar with Sonic 1 Forever, Sonic 2 Absolute, and Sonic 3 Angel Island Reborn, these are fan-made, native 16x9, fully working projects of Sonic 1, 2, and 3, with tons of customizability, bonus features, and everything, 
done for free by fans. Now, I think it is unrealistic to expect Sega to put every single feature and quality of life improvement into these games that all three of these fan remakes have, as they'll always be superior due to it being a continually evolving passion project that has no deadline or corporate mandates to it. That being said, could Sega have leveled the playing field and sweetened the deal of Sonic Origins by offering things natively out of the box that these projects can't? Yeah. As example, extra playable characters. I think it's pretty obvious this was a rushed job, and I wouldn't be shocked if it comes out that Amy and Metal Sonic were going to be playable since they were a core facet of the marketing and origins. Ah, another game Metal Sonic was cut from being playable. What does that make it, 3 now? Okay, well maybe I'm asking too much. You know, it's too much work for Sega to develop two characters' full playstyles, sprite work, etc. I mean, Sega is a small indie developer, please understand. I mean, even if they just ported Ray and Mighty, literally Mania sprites and all directly to this, I would have been happy, and in my opinion, it would have justified the $40 to $45 price tag a bit more. In a dream world, I would have loved to see Amy, Metal, Ray, and Mighty playable, but eh. For people that have played these games, there is really nothing enticing to sweeten the deal or provide a unique experience that isn't offered in prior re-releases of Sonic 1, 2, or CD. Especially if you've played these games as Sonic, Tails, or Knuckles before. Which by the way, speaking of Knuckles, he's not even playable in CD. If you know me, you know how much of a CD shill I am, and Knuckles would have been a blast to play as due to the verticality in that game's level design, but nope, that would have been too much work. I'm sorry, but playing as Knuckles again, but with Tails does not constitute a new playable character in my opinion. Which leads me to my next point. It is insane to me how little effort was put into the Sonic 1, 2, and CD ports to at least differentiate them from the original re-releases, which, by the way, were less than $10 each when they came out. These are legit just slapped straight from the mobile ports to this. I'd quickly like to give a shout out to my friend Sonic Station, as he pointed me in the right direction for even more cut stuff I'll be discussing in this video. Some games are even lacking features from the mobile releases, like Sonic 1 and 2's Time Attack. And while yes, there is a very backwards, sketchy way of accessing a Time Attack mode by going to the My Data and Ranking under the Museum Island, Ah uh, yes, of course, this is exactly where I would go to access a game mode. It's even more strange, since CD's whole mobile time attack menu is just ripped straight from the remaster. And speaking of CD, the biggest offense of this is... They removed the little yes, Sonic would say for getting a life. And the I'm outta here voice lines from the game for seemingly no reason. It was the small, weird stuff like this that added to the soul of CD and differentiated it from the other Genesis games. And for this to be labeled the definitive way to play these, and removing stuff like this so new players will never be able to experience it the way I did just over a year ago when I did my review is a, a shame, in my opinion. I know it sounds like small things, but like it's the small things like this that, you know, make these games unique. Okay, so no new character sucks, and yeah, the little details removed sucks too, but Surely there is a lot of customizability to how you play these games that makes up for it, right? Nope! The lack of customizability really all four of these games have is kind of ridiculous. You would think with the albeit quite clumsy inclusion of the drop dash, they'd maybe add, you know, you could switch abilities in like all four games to give Sonic, I don't know, the Insta Shield in Sonic 1 or the Super Peel Out in Sonic 3, which, not gonna lie, I was surprised they even kept. Kind of like what Mania did, where you could decide which abilities were even on or off for Sonic, or even turn all four of them on at once if you wanted to. Nope. I mean, there's not even a switch to turn off the spin dash in Sonic 1 if you'd like to get that authentic Sonic 1 experience. And this extends to the classic mode, which I'm pretty sure is just the whitehead ports but cropped to 4x3. Also, don't hold your breath for CRT filters, rewinding the game, or any of those cool little bells and whistles that something like the Sega Ages ports had let alone swapping the game's sprites out so you can have, I don't know, the Sonic 3 sprite in Sonic 1, etc. And apparently, this was cut. Same with the rewinding, too. Now, it's starting to be uncovered the rewinding and sprite swapping was planned, and in the rewinding case, it's even pretty much functional in the game, and evidence points to the sprite swapping likely being a scrapped feature planned, as both of these additions are unfinished in the game files. Now, I'm going to be the guy to complain about this, but on top of this, they included these coins in the anniversary mode, which replace lives. So there's no lives in the game anymore, you can retry special stages, and this is also the currency used to unlock things in the museum. 
This is all really cool, and I'm all for people having the game's difficulty adjusted so they can have a more enjoyable experience. But again, there's no option to turn this off, so for people who want the live system, you have to play in 4x3. I don't understand what's the harm in just having this as a toggle. It's just honestly really disappointing, especially when compared to other collections, let alone collections in the Sonic franchise. Now, I do want to talk about one of the positives of the collection. The main menu freaking rocks. For a game collection, and especially a Sonic collection, which have all these really aesthetic menus, you have a high bar to live up to, and I think they did a great job with that really cute 3D world map of all the different islands in their respective games, and the Mega Drive box art inspired aesthetic throughout the menus. It was really a lot of fun turning the menu off and just kind of zooming around the islands to see what I could find. Where they even included the 3D Blast and Spinball Islands for the story mode and museum, which I'll get into in a bit. They also included the different box arts for each respective game in their regions, which is really cool. The music also is fantastic, that real upbeat, tropical, mania-inspired feel to it. It's very inviting and you kind of want to just spend time in them. Which leads me to the museum. The museum is really awesome too, and it is supposed to be the kind of the allure for the older fans, I suppose. And I will admit, it is pretty enjoyable as there is a lot of concept art that has never been released before that is featured here, especially for games like Sonic 3 which was kind of lacking in concept art in general. Like this Elemental Shield prototype display, or Knuckles' different design variations like this one where he's a cat. And even having the penciled animations of the Origins cutscenes and Mania Adventures was a really neat addition in my opinion too. But here's the problem, the menus don't feel really, for lack of better words, Play tested. They're very unintuitive when it comes to navigating them, especially in terms of the settings as there's not much quality of life stuff. As for example, you can't change the video settings at all in the pause menu, so if you're, say, playing in the classic mode and want to switch borders, you have to exit the game, go back to the main menu, and then re-change your border, and then re-enter the game. It's really just, like, didn't feel play tested. The collection also has this really blurry anti-aliasing option that just makes these games look like my first video uploaded to the Eldern channel. I, uh, I never did play the original 2D games that made Sonic 1. If you want to switch the box arts on the main menu too, you have to go to the options island and then switch it from there. I would have thought this would have been a simple, you know, press of a button kind of deal like how with the Mega Man X Legacy Collection, it lets you alternate between the full US and Japanese editions of the games. On the note of the X Collection, and also the Sonic 1 and 2 Sega Ages ports, they let you change the screen size aspect ratio, filters, and even the letterbox wallpapers right from the start menu mid-game. Now to play Devil's Advocate, maybe you can't do this in Origins because it's running natively compared to the Legacy Collection and the Ages ports, which are all emulation. I'm not sure. Or to show how little effort went into the other games, you have to still switch the music OSTs and CD through the in-game CD settings menu, like the original remaster. It's even in the same menu as the mobile remaster! I figured this would have been in the main menu, you know, with the rest of the stuff, but <laughs> speaking of the music, you know how iconic and comfy the Gems Collection or Mega Collection Museum tracks are while, well, you know, you're just looking through the art and stuff? Man, I remember spending so much time flipping through what their galleries had to offer. Well, Sonic Origins follow-up to this is... Just... no music. Yep, just silence. Okay, well that kinda sucks and is pretty soulless, so you just kinda sit there and reminisce about how awesome the Mega Collection's museum was instead. But. There is a music player that you have to stay in the player screen to use, meaning you can't browse the museum and listen to the music at the same time. Like, this kind of stuff is what I mean when I just say it feels so haphazardly put together. Who's gonna be like, gee, I sure feel like listening to Door into Summer today and some mislabeled Knuckles Chaotix and 3D Blast songs. Time to boot up Sonic Origins. Speaking of the menu, not even the mission mode, which is one of the saving graces of the collection, has different music or a rearrangement of the title theme to differentiate itself. So literally in every menu on the main screen, you hear the same song playing and it can just get really grating after a while since there's nothing to mix it up. This leads me to some of the new content like the story mode, which is a cool way to get mileage out of the four games, having them all be connected together as one big campaign and these gorgeous new cutscenes done by Tyson Hess, the guy who did the uh, Mania intro and also the Mania Adventures stuff. 
They look great and are so colorful and full of life, but I hate how there has to be a butt with like everything in this collection. And I mean, no disrespect to Hess, but it's hard for me to justify spending $45 on like six minutes of cutscenes that were all over YouTube before the collection even dropped. This is one of those things that really sweetens the deal of the collection if it was competently put together. But as a main selling point, eh... The mission mode also is a really awesome addition and a creative way to replay these games with the rankings coming back and all. I absolutely love them. Obviously I haven't finished all of them, but they're really fun challenges and I thought this was a great addition overall. It feels like Sega kind of forgot they had four games under one cartridge though, as they didn't really get creative with how they could combine them or put twists on them other than the story and mission modes. For example, there's a boss rush mode for each game, which is really cool, but they could have mixed it up a bit more, maybe have a all four boss rush marathon, or like specific categories of bosses like, oh, here you can fight all the water bosses or something, I, I don't know, but uh, kind of like what SA2 did with the full boss rush, going back to that, but um, another really cool mode was the Blue Spheres mode that was added with 3K that includes a bunch of new Blue Sphere stages, kind of like what Mania did. Again, would have been really nice if they did a special stage rush through all four of the games, kind of to see how far you can go, or maybe even a survivor mode to see if you can complete all four games' special stages with like three retries or something, similar to the boss rush. Or they could have just straight thrown in the Sega Ages Challenge mode where you have to collect 100 rings, then reach the goal, or supersonic mode where you get supersonic from the first level. I mean, anything a little extra would have been nice. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of ways you can kind of expand the mileage out of these games that would have just kind of been interesting additions in my opinion at least. And of course, the crown jewel of this collection is Sonic 3 and Knuckles in full 16x9, and Headcanon did an excellent job with this. You can really tell there was a lot of love put into remaking this. I do want to keep this kind of abbreviated though, since the game is relatively new, and I don't want to spoil any of the new additions, especially for the older guys that may have not gotten their hands on it yet. But all I'm going to say is, some characters may have new forms with the Super Emeralds, there may be some new transitions, and a certain boss was added back to the full game as the, uh, for lack of better words, big arm between Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles. Also having a really cool transition between the two, so yeah. Super Sonic sprite animation's got some new frames, which is cool, but again, if I'm looking at- Oh, the sprite animation's for $45! Like, that's that's not a good thing. <laughs> um, or $40, whatever. Uh, anyways, overall, the game just looks freaking gorgeous in my opinion, and it makes me really happy to see Sonic 3 and Knuckles in its full glory. Now playable everywhere. It's also kind of funny how smooth the drop dash feels in 3K, and then you go to the other games where you can only do it in one direction. It's just so haphazardly put in, and I'm just like, wow, but... And it's kind of sadly amusing how the Sega Ages drop dash is on par with Mania or 3Ks, and it's like way smoother than the Sonic 1, 2, or CD remasters inclusion. And that's on emulation. Jeez. And yeah, I gotta bring up the elephant in the room. The Michael Jackson music is not in here. And obviously, no disrespect to Jun Sunaway as he's an absolute freaking legend, but these prototype tracks just don't fit at all to me. And listen, I'm not a lawyer, so I totally get it, and I'm not counting points against it, but it just seems like a missed opportunity to not commission T Lopes to redo the music since he was already on the project for a couple arrangements. I don't know, but it just kind of feels like Sega chinsed out here. And then on top of that, uh, Hidden Palace showed that they had like more recent prototypes so Sega just used what they had. They didn't even bother to like maybe, I don't know, get in contact with the fans so they could get the better edition of these prototype tracks. I guess we can just play T Lopes' Sonic 3 Ice Cap Reimagined on our phone while playing the stage instead of the fart music we have now. Sonic 3 is fantastic, and it's great seeing it in its full glory for new people to experience. But, and just like everything with this collection, there is an unfortunate but. Now, I'm sure most of you know about the origins behind the scenes stuff, but if you don't, the other day, Stealth went on Twitter and revealed the unfortunate behind the scenes of 3K's development for this collection, and it seems Sega had them under severe crunch, and reading between the lines, it seems Sega kept them at an arm's distance away from what was going on internally with the rest of Origins. I'll link the whole thing in the description, but it's almost like they thought, you know, Sonic 3 & Knuckles was really good because it was so rushed back in 1994, 
let's do it again. Now, if you don't know, and this goes for pretty much the whole collection in general, 3K is a bit buggy. Now, I personally haven't experienced many bugs, just a couple of goofs with the collision that just, you know, for me, that's just stuff you just laugh off. But according to Stealth, they were on a super tight deadline and asked Sega to delay Origins or work with them a little bit, which Sega, of course, denied multiple times. Stealth and his team knew that there was some overlooking on the project to reach the deadline and even asked to do major fixes closer to the deadline for the game, which also was denied. And they even offered to come back post-release to patch the game up, which is still up in the air if they even will. Because, I mean, you know, Sonic Colors Ultimate got patched so quickly. Now, at the time of this video releasing, it's about two or so weeks out from Origin's initial release date, and we have yet to get a single bug fix, so I'm kind of losing hope on that front, but who knows. Stealth also says they provided a ton of feedback during and after the development of Origin's overall, and even did work after their term was up. AKA they probably weren't getting paid too much at that point. But they did it because they love these games. I give him and his team a lot of credit for not only trying their best to give us the best experience possible for Origins in 3K, and I'm telling you guys right now, if you played Origins, you know exactly what was and what wasn't from Headcanon. The quality difference is ridiculously noticeable. I also give him a lot of respect for lack of better words having the balls to speak up about this since this very well could mean the end of communication with Sega and working on a Sonic game which is most likely their company's dream. To do again, of course. Now, I do want to point out, Stealth does mention communication isn't cut off with Sega, and his dealings with Izuka and Sega of America were great, and they were on board with pretty much everything. But like, with all of these Sonic disasters in the past, what, two decades? It's always the higher-ups at Sega of Japan who didn't want to put the funds and extra time into the project. It also sounds like Headcanon was brought on pretty late to the project, so I wonder why Sega didn't just contract them when they knew they were going to make Origins. This also explains why they used original footage of 3K at the Sonic Central last year, because it probably wasn't even done yet. Surely Sega didn't think that they knew better than a couple old little fans, right? Listen, I don't like making these negative videos that sound all nitpicky, but it's just really a massive disappointment to me how this collection turned out especially for how legendary these four games are. To be getting dirt thrown on them like this just sucks. And especially it stinks with headcanon as their tremendous work gets overshadowed by the lazy efforts on the three other games by the rest of the development team at Sega. And don't even get me started with the whole crunch thing because that is terrible too. I do hope they are able to come back and fix Origins, but I honestly wouldn't blame them if they go their separate ways like how Whitehead did and do his own thing. Hopefully they'll be able to clean this all up before it's too late, as these games deserve the absolute best, and it just stinks, you know? And of course, you know, the collection is serviceable, but this just could have been so much more, and it sucks seeing, you know, 3K, 2, 1 CD, these legendary games, not getting the full, definitive versions for these new people, let alone for the old fans to be playing, you know? So, yeah, that's where I stand on it. Um, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Thank you guys for watching. Sorry if this sounds kind of echoey. I'm recording this in my garage right now, so... And yeah, well, hey, at least they didn't pull that whole, oh, if you guys want an advanced collection or anything, you gotta buy Origins. Oh.